Hi, my name is Brett Jones, and I'm an educational psychologist and motivation scientist at Virginia Tech. And today I'm going to talk about flow. I want to answer two questions specifically. First, what is flow theory? And second, how can teachers create a classroom environment that supports flow? Hey, Dr. Jones, what is flow anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked. Flow is the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it, even at great cost, for the sheer sake of doing it. Take this kid for example. He's playing a video game, and he'd probably play all day if his parents let him. Why would he do that? Well, one reason may be that he's experiencing some elements of flow while he's playing. Okay, so then what are the elements of flow? Well, the elements or components of flow or enjoyment or optimal experience include that the task has clear goals, that is, it's bound by rules. And second, we have a chance of completing the task. Third, the challenge should match our skills. Fourth, the task provides immediate feedback. Fifth, we must be able to concentrate. Sixth, we act with a deep but effortless involvement that removes the worries and frustrations of everyday life. Seventh, we have a sense of control over our actions. And eighth, our concern for ourself disappears. And finally, our sense of time is altered. Hey, Dr. Jones, what are you doing now? Oh, you interrupted me just when I was getting into flow. You see, in order to get into flow, you need to be able to concentrate. Remember from number five on the list of components of flow? We must be able to concentrate. That's nice, but how do you pronounce that person's name on the slide? Oh, well, yeah, I should have explained that. His name is Mahai Chiksent Mahai. And you can remember it because you can break down his name sort of like this, Mahai Chiksent Mahai. It means St. Michael from Transylvania. But anyway, we're getting off on a side note here. Maybe it would help you to understand flow better if I gave you a description of flow. Here's a description that was given by a music composer. This person says, you are in an ecstatic state to such a point that you feel as though you almost don't exist. I've experienced this time and time again. My hand seems devoid of myself and I have nothing to do with what is happening. I just sit there watching in a state of awe and wonderment, and the music flows out by itself. This description helps us understand several things about the flow experience. One thing is that the underlying knowledge and skills are so practiced and automatized that it makes it easy to experience flow. Some people call it getting into the zone and say that time slows down and everything seems to move in slow motion. Now these things can only happen when you practice something over and over again so that it's automatic and you don't have to think about it consciously. Let's talk about self-consciousness and flow. Self-consciousness can get in the way of achieving flow. If you can't keep perfectionism in check, it's hard to get into flow. So if you start thinking about living up to expectations or start thinking about what others are thinking of you, you won't be able to stay in flow. So that raises the question, how long does flow last? Well, you can't get into flow right away, and the length is not as long as hours. So more typically, you're in flow for a few minutes, then out, then back in. It's hard to stay in flow for a long time because we get distracted. We may get hungry or sleepy or have to go to the bathroom. Or if you're playing the piano in a beautiful tune, someone might interrupt you. When I was talking to Chiksent Mahai, he told me that 15% of people never experience flow and that 15% of people experience flow every day. There's also this thing called deep flow. As Chiksent Mahai wrote, how much time a person spends in flow depends on how strict a definition of flow one wishes to use. Extremely intense and complex flow experiences probably occur at best only a few times in a lifetime. So here we're talking about something where you don't go in and out of very quickly. As he says here, 
you may never experience this or only a few times in your lifetime. Okay, that brings us to our second question. What can teachers do to get students into flow? Well, teachers can establish clear goals and task expectations. Teachers can also provide feedback to students. They should focus on students' performance and tell students what they did well and what they need to improve upon. They should balance the challenge with students' skills. They should also provide activities that help students obtain basic skills, because when basic skills are learned, they're more likely to have them automatic so that they can get into the flow experience easier. Teachers can also remove distractions so that students can concentrate on what they're working on. So these things then lead to the question, should we expect students to be able to get into flow? I mean, is it realistic for students to be able to get into flow in the classroom with all other different types of students in the classroom? Well, that's a question you have to think about yourself. Uh, my opinion is that you can try to do your best to set the conditions to allow them to try to enter flow, but as teachers, we can't really expect that they're gonna get into too much flow or at least too much deep flow for a long period of time. Now, certainly students might be able to do that on their own at home if they have a quiet place where they can work and study. But in the classroom, I think all of these recommendations, if I go back to them here, you can see that they're all reasonable expectations that we know are part of good teaching anyway, that promote student motivation and learning. So if teachers focus on these things, they'll do their best to get students into flow. But if they don't quite get into flow, these things are consistent with other motivation principles and learning principles. To understand how flow theory fits into the bigger picture of motivating students, let's look at the music model of motivation. In this model, you have five components, empowerment, usefulness, success, interest, and caring, which form an acronym to form the word music. The purpose of the music model is to provide an organizational framework for instructors to use when designing and diagnosing instruction to motivate others. The music model is based on motivation theory and research, and it organizes motivating strategies into one of these five categories. It can be used with any instructional approach, and it's for instructors who don't need to know every motivation theory, they just need to know what works. So, to keep it simple, instructors need to ensure that students perceive that they have some control over some aspect of their learning. That's the empowerment component. The usefulness component is that instructors ensure that students understand why the content is useful. For the success component, instructors need to ensure that students perceive that they can succeed if they put forth the effort. For the interest component, instructors need to ensure that students are interested in what they're supposed to be learning. And for the caring component, instructors need to ensure that students perceive that the teacher cares about whether they meet the course objectives. So if we look back at these implications, which I showed previously, we can then map these onto the music model. So let's take these same points and tie them to the music model. And what we see is that a lot of these fit within the success component of the music model. For example, establishing clear goals and task expectations can help students succeed because they know what they need to do to succeed. Also, providing feedback allows students to know whether they're being successful or not. And balancing the challenge and skills helps students to succeed. And finally, helping students obtain basic skills will, of course, allow them to be successful at more complex tasks. So these all fit within the success component. Now within the interest component, we have things such as removing distractions, because by removing distractions, it allows students to concentrate and focus and pay attention. And paying attention is part of the interest component. Okay then, we can see how the flow theory is very successful at meeting the success and interest components of the music model. It may also meet the empowerment, usefulness, and caring components in some ways, um, but the primary emphasis, in my opinion, is on success and interest. That brings us to the end of this video. If you'd like more information, please visit my website, or if you have questions, feel free to email me directly. Thanks for watching.